Good morning and welcome to another Tuesday tour. It's John Sauter along with Michael Fairchild behind the camera from your Purdue Alumni Association. And we're here in the heart of campus on a cold day in February, I can tell you. It's uh, wind chill, I believe, is seven degrees. So it's flaps down today. But a reminder of, to you when you used to walk to class in this weather, no problem at all and the students are out and about today. So it's just another day on campus. Uh, we're gonna feature the Armory, just behind me. Uh, it's 103 years old in, uh, in April. April 1918, the Armory opened up and it's uh, filled with history. And I suspect many of you have been in there for many reasons. And we're gonna highlight many of those and hope to bring back a lot of those memories. So we're gonna talk about the Armory and the headquarters of ROTC, which is right here also. And that goes back to the very beginning of Purdue. So uh, with this introduction, now we're gonna go inside where it's a little warmer. We'll see you there. Okay, we're back inside the armory now, the huge armory, uh, very interesting looking structure. Uh, one of the quotes I read, it, it said this has the poorest acoustical quality of any building on campus. I suspect that's true. But uh, a storied history here uh, with the armory, 103 years old. Um, and actually it goes back way back into uh, the beginnings, the impetus for this to uh, actually 1862. Abraham Lincoln signs the, the, the Morrill Act, establishing land grant schools. And as we know, that meant they had to focus on engineering and agriculture. Well, the third prong of that requirement actually was military science, uh, which was evolving in those days. And so they wanted to make sure military science was included in the curriculum, uh, which is why on many land grant schools around the country now, uh, they have still have to this day strong ROTC programs. Um, so the classes opened in 1874. There was a building here, a wooden structure, and that actually was kind of the social and cultural center of campus, uh, as well as a place where the cadets could gather for uh, close order drill and training and all those sorts of things. Um, that burned to the ground. Um, World War I uh, comes upon us, and so. Uh, in April of 1918, uh, this building is uh, dedicated and opened uh, right next to Stewart Field, uh, next door, which was the football field and the baseball diamond you know, for Purdue for many years. There's a great photograph of that. In fact, we're gonna have a series of photographs we'll be showing you. Uh, the dedication ceremony held in the building with the troops standing at attention and the flag. Uh, you, can, you can see that one also. Um, but it really became kind of uh, uh, to this day is still kind of a gathering spot for large crowds that leave this kind of space uh, available to them on campus. Um, so April uh, of 1918, it opens up. Um, and just to give you the setting a little bit, uh, World War I is starting to wrap up. The armistice is gonna be signed in about seven months, November of 1918. So there's a little bit of hope, you know, on the scene there. Uh, but World War I did take uh, 67 Purdue students and uh, those 67 students are still memorialized in our union building. In fact, the fund drive was underway for the Memorial Union Building, and uh, they broke ground for that in 1922. 1924, it opened up, and the plaque in the Great Hall has the name of those 67 students who died during World War I. So this new building on campus, the, the fund drive, um, there, there was hope on the scene that we were going to recover. I might remind you that the worldwide pandemic was going on then also. 50 million people would be killed worthwhile worldwide, and uh, uh, 11 Purdue students died as a result of the pandemic flu at that particular time also. Um, but time marched on. Uh, the building has been here again for 103 years. Um, just a great spot on campus for a variety of gatherings, and I kind of want to go through some of those. Um, and we'll show you some pictures and maybe have some memories uh, come to you. Uh, one, it was a place for a close order drill. And so this is where our ROTC units, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, uh, still to this day have close order drill. For a while back then, it also served as barracks um, for the students uh, when they were here. Um, you know, other, other uses of it uh, in, included uh, class registration. Class registration took place here starting in the 30, 30s and 40s or so, all the way up into the 50s. Uh, basically, the arrangement was 
there was a card for each seat in each class. The students came in, uh, in their, when their turn uh, was called, and they actually went to the class, went to the section, picked out their card, and that's how they assembled their schedule. In the 1950s, that was computerized. Actually, Jim Blakesley, a member of the class of 50, uh, president of the class of 1950, the greatest generation, uh, computerized that, and the cards were computerized cards uh, that were key punched, put in a computer, and that was actually printed out for you. Uh, so registration took here during that time. One of my favorites, the Egg Alumni Fish Fry was held here for many years until it moved to the fairgrounds in Indianapolis. And uh, I can remember coming actually to many of those Ag Fish Fries. Um, the place is filled with tables and chairs. Uh, you assembled behind a rope. It was a cold day just like this. You piled your coat someplace. There's a rope across here. Everybody accumulates. And they actually, as I recall, they fired a shotgun and they dropped the rope and everybody runs to their seats. And uh, the thing that you like the most at the Ag Fish Fry, in addition to the best fish you could get at the time, um, were the goodie bags. They had goodie bags at each seat filled with ballpoint pens and letter openers and just all sorts of things. Uh, candy and, and treats and pamphlets and flyers and all sorts of interesting gadgets. Bottle openers, I still have a letter opener, as a matter of fact, at, at home from 1979 that I used. Uh, I remember Earl Butts being the speaker here back in 1976 with a big flag. Uh, a rather rowdy event, as a matter of fact, but, uh, but quite memorable, all taking place here um, within the uh, armory. Uh, robotics competition. High schools have robotics competition here, where they assemble a variety of robotic instruments uh, robots themselves and they either play basketball or have some sort of competition that takes place here. Um, related to that um, is the Rube Goldberg contest and that's the uh, contest where they put together uh, a simple task but as many steps as you can do. So it's 200 steps to, to uh, put a piece of bread in a toaster or something like that. Uh, that takes place here with the Hall of Music projecting it on a screen. Perfect location for that. Uh, there's something called Project Move Out. Project Move Out is here. That's where they put in tables. This has been going on for about 20 years now, and the students who live on campus uh, donate at the end of the year as they're moving out. They donate all their extra belongings they don't want to take home with them. And so it can be clothing and bedding, and it's quite amazing what they accumulate. TVs, computers, all the variety of things are, books are accumulated here. Uh, it's accumulated, then eventually, at the end of it all, uh, by way of a united way, they, they uh, distribute these to the local agencies in town. And uh, just a great story uh, of how that all came to be and how that's organized. Many of you may remember the location here for commencement, commencement lineup. This is where you come and find your school and find your line and find the, your place in the alphabet because you go from here to the Hall of Music and eventually up on stage, and if you're in the May commencement, they actually hand you your diploma with your name on it. And so to go from here to there takes a lot of coordination. It all takes place right here. Uh, uh, last year we had a virtual commencement. Virtual commencement was uh, by way of uh, internet, uh, but assembled here were all the packages that you might have received. And so uh, you were actually sent your diploma a variety with, uh, with a variety of Purdue paraphernalia and uh, things within that package, that was all assembled right here, as a matter of fact. Um, a, a few other things. Um, back in the 40s and 50s, um, we had a housing unit for veterans that was called the black and white units. Black and white units, about 150 houses, little units, over on State Street, made out of cardboard, but they were actually assembled in the armory. And so in cooperation with National Homes, they could assemble about four of those uh, a day um, and uh, get them over there and get them erected. And so it was quick housing when they needed housing very quickly. All happened here. Many dances have taken place here. Uh, speaking of dances, the first dance marathon on campus was held here. And that's a student organization that raises funds by having the students dance for an extended period of time. I think in 2005 was the first one. And they raised about $1,500 all for Riley Hospital in Indianapolis. Um, uh, last uh, 2019, 
uh, was the most recent one on campus, and they raised over a million dollars for Riley Hospital at that particular dance marathon. So uh, a very worthwhile endeavor, but again, it, it started here. Um, I remember also, there, uh, we had a ceremony in here as a part of the Vision 21 capital campaign under Steve Beery. And Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan were actually the honorary chair people at that particular time. Um, uh, that was uh, 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 all held, a lot of it was all held here with a large crowd celebrating that significant fundraising effort uh, at that particular time. Uh, and on and on it goes, all the variety of things that are here. In fact, if we look today, we can see some students are working out. It's actually a study area uh, for some of the students because you can spread out here for pretty well. Uh, the students can come here and uh, work out and study and be separated so properly socially distanced along the way. Um, so, great facility. Uh, now we're going to switch gears a little bit about and talk about uh, ROTC and we'll uh, move over here in just a second. We're back and now we would like to highlight ROTC, the headquarters of ROTC right here. And so we're going to make our way back to the front door, but you can see a nice graphic over here that's been here for a while, I believe. Uh, highlighting ROTC and the three main branches, Army, Air Force, Navy, and the Marines, um, all headquartered here on two floors, first floor, second floor, or the second floor is the deck, I think the Navy like to refer to that as. Uh, again, ROTC, a storied history, it goes all the way back to 1862, Morrill Act. Uh, we had to have a military training uh, offering, and so actually, Professor Harvey Wiley steps forward in 1876 and uh, teaches a voluntary class on infantry to some students. And that's kind of the beginning of ROTC off and on uh, for, for quite some time until it gets quite organized around World War I. And eventually then they move into this building in 1918. Um, ROTC on this campus is a very successful operation. Uh, these days they have around 500 students, uh, many more previous to that because uh, if you were on campus back then, uh, ROTC was required of all male students up until 1964. And so uh, you were a part of that operation. After that, it trailed off. And uh, uh, now there's around 500 in the different branches or so. Very dedicated young people with the ROTC operations. I, I know that for a fact because uh, I still run in the track at Lambert Fieldhouse at 6 in the morning, and there are the units on their day of physical training there, uh, working out, or you can uh, hear them outside running on nicer days, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but a lot of proud graduates of the ROTC program. Uh, we have astronauts and admirals and generals, every, uh, every officer position available in the services have come through the ROTC program. Uh, as a part of commencement uh, in May, we have a wonderful, uh, uh, well done uh, commissioning ceremony you know, for the different services. So it's, uh, it's a very well-run operation um, uh, on the campus uh, that has that, that storied history to it. Um, uh, we have a lot of administrators who have come through the military, through ROTC. Uh, as you can imagine, they come here as instructors like the campus and they stick around and uh, they've brought some valuable experience to the, to the campus. Um, and I also want to make sure I mentioned uh, up here is the uh, Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame was established uh, a little over 30 years ago and it highlights some of the outstanding ROTC uh, graduates who have gone on to really uh, establish themselves in their, in their chosen area. Um, and it's, uh, it's ROTC's way to, to uh, provide uh, recognition for those folks. And this is the most recent class that's up now, uh, but it's accumulated over the last 30 years or so. So, uh, we hope that gives you some good perspectives on the Armory Building and ROTC, brought some memories back to you, and uh, uh, that's what we're trying to do. And so on behalf of Michael and your Purdue Alumni Association, hail Purdue.